So, welcome to this afternoon session. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Yannick Sir, formerly Marseille and now Baltimore. And he will uh, speak about two things that um, have been developed in the last years. And they are interesting because uh, the connection was not evident between them and with the old staff, which is uh, fractional Poincare inequalities and uh, Q curvatures. And, uh, okay, thanks. Do you hear me? No? Do you hear me? Okay, so what I would like to talk about, thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation. This is very nice to be here. Ah, the organizer is here. So what I would like to talk about is, as you know, um, um, there are many cases where actually you can cook up like metric spaces or, or some manifold for which you don't have Poincaré inequalities. I mean, it's an assumption you have to put on the manifold to have Poincaré or on the space to have Poincaré inequalities, the local ones. So. Uh, what I will present is actually a result uh, where, for some kind of manifolds, where you are considering some type of curvature, there is a strong link between Q curvature and actually the existence of uh, Poincaré, standard Poincaré inequalities, local ones and uh, that you self-improve to non-local Poincaré inequalities to fractional ones. So let me come to that. Okay, so it's a joint work with my colleague at Hopkins, Yi Wang. And uh, so on four, so you consider a four manifold. And like many years ago, Branson, uh, found, I, I mean, many years ago, Panitz, on this type of manifold, introduced this operator. But I, so the by Laplacian plus delta of two thirds of scalar curvature times the metric. So R is scalar curvature, this is Ricci, D is a di di dif differential, and delta is a co differential. And Panis introduced this operator because he was studying like some uh, homotopy groups on, on the sphere. And actually, a few years after, Branson figured that this operator was linked with a, a notion of curvature, which is a Q curvature, and which is given by this expression. And E is a tressless part of the Ricci tensor. Okay? So R is a scalar curvature, so this is a trace of the Ricci tensor. One over N, the trace, one over four, the trace of the Ricci tensor. And so basically, Q, the idea of Q curvature on four manifolds generalizes the notion of Gaussian curvature on two manifolds, on surfaces. In the following sense, uh, if you change conformally the metric, like you consider G U to be exponential to U times G naught, then you change conformally the operator. And actually, uh, QG naught, which is uh, Q curvature in, uh, yes? There is a Z. The co-differential and the differential. Two over three. You are a little bit on the picky side. E squared is a traceless part of the Ricci tensor. And it's a three also here. I have the feeling to be in calculus class. Okay? 
So actually, if you change conformally the metric, the, the operator changes conformally also. No, it's fine. And uh, the Q curvature changes conformally and satisfies uh, PGU, so I never remember the formula, um, PG naught U plus 2Q G naught equal to 2QGU exponential for U. So this is the analogous transformation that you have for, for the Gaussian curvature. You know, when you change conformally the Gaussian curvature on a surface, for the Gaussian curvature, you have like minus G naught U uh, plus K G naught, where K is the Gaussian curvature equal to KGU exponential to you. Okay, so this is a case of four manifolds. So, okay, so this is clear, right? On four manifolds, we have this operator, which is conformally, exponential u is, exponential u is, to u is a conformal factor. So u is, a, yeah, u if you want is a conformal factor. But, I mean, the conformal factor is, so this is clear. Exactly. Well, exciting thing, this I don't know, but uh, <laughs> yes, they are simple pleasure. It's a simple pleasure to consider a four manifold, and on these four manifolds, you have like, uh, <clears throat> so Panis found this operator by, by means, by uh, ad hoc calculations, and you have this, uh, this change of, this conformal change, which is very important geometrically in conformal geometry, and you have that on four manifolds, you have like the analogous of the Gaussian curvature, I mean, unanalogous possible of the Gaussian curvature. You see that these two equations are extremely similar, right? So, um, yeah, this is a fourth order uh, operator. So this is a fourth order. The bilaplation in itself is not conformally covariant. You have to add low order terms, differential low order terms, which can be quite complicated to make it conformally covariant. Well, it happens that this theory can be generalized to higher dimensional manifold of even dimension. Except that in this case, <coughs> The equivalent of the Panitz operator are not known. The, the, the explicit expression are not known. So for instance, in even dimension, I mean, you, you would have like equation on the flat metric of this type. Um, equation of this type, yeah, exponential two times, exponential n u. Okay, in the flat case on even dimensions. So it's, it's been like, okay, so it seems to be like an ad hoc type of thing. I mean, you just cook up some, something that you call a curvature, and, uh, 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 and then why is, it, why is it relevant geometrically? Well, it happens that you have the chern gauss bonnet formula which tells you that the Euler characteristic of your four manifold is one over four pi square, the integral on the manifold of the veil tensor divided by eight. I will explain you what it is. Huh? The veil tensor divided by eight plus Q curvature. So you know very well what is a gauss bonnet formula for surfaces. And, uh, and in the case of, of four manifolds, you have this formula. So here you have an additional term compared to the gauss bonnet formula, which is a veil tensor, which is a curvature tensor measuring uh, how far you are from being locally conformally flat. If uh, the veil tensor is in zero, this means that you are locally conformally flat. So locally, you are like a piece of the sphere. So, um, so this formula g clearly carries like some geometric and, uh, and topological information 
related to this Q curvature. So this is a very important formula. And so the question is, my goal is to get like on which manifold, what, what, which is the role of Q curvature on conformally flat manifolds with respect to the existence, with respect to the existence of a point carré, a point carré inequality. So what I will describe first is the case of isoperimetric inequality. And then I will move to Poincaré inequality and uh, fractional Poincaré inequality. So let me state right away what we proved uh, with Yi. And let me explain you uh, let me explain you the, um, the meaning. So what we proved is the following um, theorem. You take mg to be the following manifold, Rn endowed with the metric exponential 2u, so the conformally flat metric, exponential 2u times the flat metric, okay? M, M, M is this, this, what I call mg is this manifold. And yeah, so uh, let me come to that. So be a complete, non-compact, even dimensional manifold, okay? Touch that. First hypothesis, U is a normal. So I will, exp I will explain you what this means. It means that U of X, so my conformal factor, or the log of my conformal factor, is of the form one over Cn, a constant depending only on the dimension, the sum in Rn of log of y divided by x minus y plus qg of y d vgy plus a constant for some constant. So we say that the metric is normal if you have this formula for the conformal factor. I will explain you where it comes from. Okay? The second assumption is that if I denote beta plus the total, uh, the total, the positive, and uh, the total mass of the positive part of the Q curvature of this manifold, it has to be less than Cn, the same constant here, which is like an explicit expression, which is 2 to the n minus 2, n minus 2 over 2 factorial pi of n over 2, and the negative part, beta minus, the total negative part, has to be finite. Under these assumptions, which are basically sharp, you have the existence of a fractional Poincaré inequality. So for any alpha, there exists a constant, there exists a constant C, which depends only on beta plus, beta minus, and the dimension, okay? Such that for any function and any Euclidean ball, you have this inequality. It has this average, I will explain you what it is. and <laughs> omega of x is exponential n u of x, <clears throat> and this is the average of f, and uh, 
for any safety. Okay? For any alpha, be, be, yeah, for any alpha between zero and one. Zero and two, sorry, with my notation. So what, do, so do, what does the CRM say? The CRM say that if you have a conformally flat manifold of this type, okay, such that the total curvature Basically, this assumption is you have, a you have to be careful because uh, you have a complete manifold, a complete non-compact. So this is not clear to have like a, a Poincaré inequality in all the possible cases. So basically, uh, under the assumption that the total curvature, so the sum, the integral of the positive part and the negative part satisfies this assumption, plus the fact that the metric is normal, okay, then uh, you have like a, a fractional point carry inequality. Actually, we will prove that we have like a point carry inequality, a p point carry inequality, and then this p point carry inequality for p equal to two improves to self improves to a fractional one. Here you recognize the Galliardo norm, right? You recognize the Galliardo norm. Okay. Okay, omega dx is a weight related to, this is basically to, 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 make it, to make it geometric, if you have g, which is of the form exponential 2u dx squared, dvg, okay, is exponential nu dx. The volume element given by the conformal factor. So actually here you measure actually the volume element of, um, so not only you have a Poincaré inequality, but you have a weighted one. Okay? Why mm, oh well, alpha equals two, you, you have blow up on the constant here. Well, if you put if you rescale properly by basis Bourgain Mironescu, this quantity co converges to uh, to the standard gradient. Well, it's not in Bourgain basis Mironescu, but this is almost there, right? Okay, so so this is basically what I want to prove. So I will not prove it completely. I will give you like a, an explanation because actually what I would like to discuss is the way you build functional inequalities on this type of manifold. And in particular, on complete manifold, let me say a few words about what happens for isoperimetric type inequalities. And actually I need a lot of Okay, I need a lot of tools to prove this CRM. Um, but let me, let, me, um, let me make a digression because this is uh, important on isoperimetric inequalities on these manifolds. Uh, because of course, if you want, I mean, this is the simplest somehow inequality you would like to prove Oh, okay, even if it's a hard one. So actually, there is a famous inequality due to Fiala and Uber. Well, Huber, which proves the following: if you have like a surface which is simply connected and complete, Oh, no, I mean on a surface, right? Then the volume of any bounded set, omega, is given by 1 over 2 times 2 pi minus the integral of the positive part of the Gaussian curvature, dvg, area squared. Okay? So this is like, this constant is optimal, 
And it did tell you that this type of quantity plays, so total Gaussian curvature, or at least its positive part, plays a very important role if you want to get isoperimetric inequalities. OK? Minus. I'm not lucky today eh, with uh, my handwriting. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, what my colleague did, Yi Wang, so she generalized this inequality in higher dimension. Consider changing this, this total mass of the Gaussian curvature by total mass of Q curvature. So what she proved uh, is that under like um, all the assumptions that I was given in my theorem, right? She proved that under the same assumption as the previous theorem, she proved that you have indeed any bounded set with smooth boundary, you have like an isoperimetric inequality. OK? This is not a trivial result, huh? in the sense that this is very hard in very general case to obtain isoperimetric. Think about cartan adama manifold. It's not known the isoperimetric inequality for cartan adama when all the sectional curvature are negative. Right? So this is not a priori obvious. If you are given any manifold, to derive uh, as most as sharp as you can isoperimetric inequalities. You know that it depends only on these two quantities. On, so it's not known in general, but you know that it depends only on this uh, total mass of the Q curvature and the dimension. But this is not known. I mean, she doesn't have like a clean expression as this one for higher dimensional versions. It's not really a compactness. It's based. I will come to that. I will come to that. But this is not. This is not a compactness. Uh, this is based on uh, the David Sam theory of strong and A infinity weights so that I will develop a little bit. Okay. So this is not a compactness argument, but the constant is not known. So this is not as good as this fiala uber uh, inequality, but at the same time, this is like quite remarkable that you can have such a clean inequality in a manifold which, is like, which can be like... Um... So let me make a remark. Here? Yeah. Yes. Why does it depend on beta minus? Because you have like, in this case, you have like, I, I mean, this is like, uh, uh, you, you, have, you, you need to have, like, you, you need, if you don't assume something on the negative part of the Q curve, you want a complete manifold. Huh? So if you don't assume something on the negative part of the, of, uh, the Q curvature on the whole manifold, then you, you, might not have, uh, you might not have an isoperimetric inequality. In the two-dimensional case, it depends only on the, po on the positive part of the, of the Gaussian curvature. But in higher dimension, you have to, to, to have the negative part because of different directions. So let me make a remark about normality is that if the limit inf when x goes to infinity of the scalar curvature is positive, 
then u is normal. Okay? So instead of assuming that this weird condition of normality that I wrote before, you can assume, like, for instance, at infinity, your, your, your scalar curvature is non-negative, which is something giving you some hint about the behavior, of course, at infinity, right? Uh, of, um, and the normality assumption is a necessary condition. There are counterexamples to the isoperimetric inequality if you are not normal. So the, 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 the normality assumption, you want, I mean, what you have to understand is that you, have, you are on a complete manifold non-compact. Huh? So if you want, uh, uh, you have necessarily, you, have, you might have hands and ends and stuff like that. I mean, you, you have necessarily to ask something at infinity to, uh, to get something. Uh, to get something. I mean, there, 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 there is necessary uh, a condition at infinity. Uh, ne, uh, let me think two seconds. Well, the metric is not normal, though, so I think that it doesn't. Uh, how do you, because I'm conformally flat, huh? so the, 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 the hyperbolic space is conformally flat, but, uh, but uh, the metric is not normal. Mm, yeah. Um, okay, so let me, before going into uh, uh, the proof or how you, the strategy to prove this fractional point inequality, let me do a little bit of theory of weights. Because actually this is like uh, the crucial, I mean, this is like the important part, uh, somehow the, the analytical part of, um, um, so W is an AP weight, it's a soup on every ball, of the average of W minus P prime over P times P over P prime is less than a constant for any ball on the manifold. Okay, and P prime is a conjugate of P. Okay, this is an AP weight. So A1 weight, A1, you are A1, if, uh, so you have like uh, some sort of, of, uh, of a limiting case of, uh, of that, you are A1 if uh, uh, the average is less than the weight, or times a constant. This is the, the limiting case. This is when you take P goes, going to one in, uh, Okay. So AP weights are extremely important in harmonic analysis because you can prove the RD little wood maximal function is bounded from LP weighted into LP weighted if and only if the weight is AP. So this is a necessary condition and sufficient condition to be AP to have boundedness on weighted spaces, on weighted Lebesgue spaces of the RD little wood maximal functional. So these are very important in uh, functional analysis. And they satisfy a lot of properties. One of the most important properties that they satisfy is the reverse shoulder inequality. So any AP weight satisfies a reverse shoulder inequality, where R is larger than one. OK? So in particular, by getting lemma, they are a little bit better than LR, LR, uh, a little bit better than L1. Um, and it, here you have to take it in average, sorry, of course. Uh, okay, so 
you, you denote the class A infinity as a union when P goes to 1 of AP. So you are A infinity if you are one of the AP for P larger than 1. Actually, you have another characterization of A infinity in terms of, of the Lebesgue measure, but I will not need it. Uh, so what is important for us is um, the notion of strong A infinity weight. So David and Sams, a few years ago, introduced the notion of strong A infinity weight. So an example, so, so what is it, a strong A infinity weight? So you take omega, a continuous function, which is non-negative, and you introduce like some sort of distance, quasi-distance, where Bxy is a ball of diameter x minus y containing x and y. So you can prove that this thing is a quasi-distance. And if you introduce uh, um, uh, some sort of intrinsic distance defined by you take any path gamma you take any path gamma in bxy connecting x to y and you introduce like the distance which is the infimum of all the gammas of the integral of a gamma of omega 1 over n dn ds. Then it's easy to see that omega a infinity implies that there exists a constant such that for all x and y, this distance is bounded by this quasi-distance. And David and Sams prove that A is strong in A infinity if the reverse holds. So delta omega is bounded by C d omega. So in other words, that these two quasi-distances are equivalent. It's a strong A infinity weight, okay? So for example, any A1 weight, any A1 weight is strong A infinity. For example, mod x to the power alpha, which is a canonical A2 weight for alpha between minus n and n, is strong A infinity Uh, for alpha less than zero, bigger than n, since in this case it's a one, and this is still strong a infinity for alpha positive less than n. Okay, but the weight x one to the power alpha is not strong a infinity. Because basically, you can choose a path along the x2 axis, for instance. And you, you never have this equivalent between the, the distances, right? So this, is, this weight is not strong A infinity. So the weight of the fractional Laplacian is not, in the cafarelli sylvester extension, is not strong weight A infinity, OK? Huh? This is bad. Uh, so why do I say that? Because David and Sams developed a lot of, so now you can, you can try. To have like uh, weighted inequalities using these weights. And uh, what Yi Wang proved uh, is that if U is normal, 
plus the assumption on the manifold that I was mentioning, then omega of x equal exponential au, nu is a strong infinity. Okay? But the thing is that David and Sams proved that strong A infinity satisfies uh, Sobolev inequality in terms of the weight uh, omega of x, okay, where omega is a, a strong A infinity weight. But then you just take, to get the isoperimetric inequality, you just need to take the characteristic function, well, you smooth it out but the characteristic function of the set omega, in, you plug it to uh, the Sobolev inequality and you get the isoperimetric inequality. Okay? Like the, this is one way to prove isoperimetric inequality, right? Okay. So, the strategy Ah, but well, let me come to that. Let me come to that. I'm coming now. So the problem is that now I want to get like Poincaré inequalities. But what I know now is that I have much stronger information. What I know now is that my weight, okay, I want to get weighted Poincaré inequalities. So my weight, I know now, is strong A infinity by the theorem of Wang, right? Mm -hmm. She, it's a she, yes, it's a lady. She was a former student of Alice Chang. And so now I know that my weight, exponential A nu, is A infinity. Strong A infinity. And actually, you have a theorem due to David and Sams who proved a pointwise Poincare inequality in the following sense. If you are strong A infinity, for any X and Y in, in Rn, say, you have that this pointwise Poincaré inequality. There are too many U's, right? Let me call it V. So this is the starting point of our theory. If I have a strong infinity weight, David and Sams prove that you have this pointwise inequality. So you relate like this distance okay, between f of x and f of y to the gradient of f, right? This is some sort of generalization of the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Uh, yes, here. You have all this weight times the gradient times another weight. Okay, so this is some sort of generalization Okay? So the first thing that you prove, so the strategy of proving, for proving a fractional, well, there are many ways to prove a fractional point inequality, but one strategy is that I developed a long time ago with uh, Moore and Rus and with uh, Rus, uh, is to actually, you prove that you have, for getting weighted point inequalities, 
you prove that you have first some sort of weighted standard Poincaré inequality, and then you improve it to a non-local one, to fractional one, by using like harmonic analysis methods. So the strategy is first you prove, so let me call it star. Star implies a Poincaré inequality, a weighted Poincaré inequality, Okay, for which you have to work a little bit. And from the weighted Poincaré inequality, by self-improvement, you get a fractional Poincaré inequality. So I will explain you how to do the self-improvement. Hmm? This is a theorem, huh? this is a theorem of David and Sams. They prove that if you are... The weight is one, identically one, well this... These are measures of the ball with respect to this measure. Yes, yes, yes. It looks like a, uh, not a point of inequality, but yes. Okay. So the strategy is at first. This, what we prove, is that this implies a Poincaré inequality. It is much stronger. Okay? On my manifold, with all my assumptions, blah, 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 okay, I have like a Poincaré inequality. And from this Poincaré inequality, I will self-improve it. It's going to self-improve automatically to a fractional Poincaré inequality. I will explain you why. I have time. So what we proved first, which is not completely obvious, but this is not extremely difficult, is that you have a P Poincaré inequality. Well, I'm going to just state it for P equal to 2, which is, well, I'm, I state it in general. So, so what we proved first is that for strong A infinity weight, omega, for any ball Euclidean, you have like a P Poincaré inequality, so something which looks like more of a Poincaré inequality, F minus its average to the power P, omega of X dx, is less than C omega of B P over N times the integral over twice the ball of gradient F of U of X to the P omega of X 1 minus P over N DX. Okay? So actually what you can prove is that starting from the david Sam's inequality, you prove this P Poincaré inequality. Okay? Okay, so now you know that your manifold that I was mentioning at the beginning, Rn conformally flat with this exponential u, where u is uh, normal with finite total, Q curvature is uh, supports this manifold supports a P Poincaré inequality weighted P Poincaré inequality of this type. It's exactly what you prove. Okay, so now the second step, which is the main point, is self-improving to fractional ones.
So you take p equal to 2. Okay, what I'm going to describe, I, I don't have a WSP Poincaré inequality. It's a, it's a, what I'm going to describe now is a very Hilbertian method. It's something related to L2. This is very linear somehow. Uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not able to do like a P fractional Poincaré inequality. So let me take P equal to 2. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can do that also. That's right, yeah. They self-improve to give the Sobolev, yeah. But this is different, yeah. In this situation for the weights, for these weights, you mean? I don't know. I think that, let me, let me check something because uh, David and Sams proved already that the Sobolev inequality holds. Let me state you what it is. Well, well you don't want? No, 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 but I, I mean that David and Sams proved that if omega is a strong infinity weight, you control a weighted LP star norm by uh, a, a weighted gradient W1P dot norm. There is, there is, there is, a, a, there is, there is a, 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 this one, this one, a fractional Poincaré and a Sobolev, yeah. And from the Sobolev, you get isoperimetric inequality. From local Sobolev, yes. Yes. Yes, yes. I don't, I don't know for measures how to derive directly a fractional Poincaré inequality for weighted ones. You know? Well, you will show me afterwards then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I just know when I... But do you have an example of a space for which you have a fractional Poincaré without having a Poincaré? Yeah, 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 yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> okay. So the strategy is to improve, to self-improve. So, so the thing is that you take f. So let me uh, let me come to. Uh, so you take p equal to two. So the self-improvement. of Poincaré towards fractional Poincaré. So you consider like, uh, um, so here, you, another way to write this formula is you take like f such that the mean value of f respect to, uh, to uh, b omega is zero, and then you have like f square dvg, right, because of what I wrote before, is less than c times the volume of the ball respect to the metric g to the power 2 over n times 2b, the gradient of g of f of x, dvg. Now you define the multiplicative operator m of f to be the multiplication by the characteristic function of b, and you define a measure d mu, let me call it 2, like omega of x, characteristic function of the twice of the ball times the Lebesgue measure. So then you rewrite your Poincaré inequality as of two operators, I mean, you have to introduce a new operator, which is L mu 2 of f, which is basically the Laplace g of f. So in other words, this is like the sum from i equal to 1 to n of 1 over omega i, omega y, dy omega of x, 1 minus 2 over n, di f. 
So what does it tell you? It tells you that in L2, with respect to the measure uh, Rn, with respect to the measure mu2, m of f is less than uh, one half, right, of L mu2 times a constant of f, right? I just use the fact that gradient g of f gvg square is like delta f of square, uh, sorry, one half square dvg, right? Which is a trivial case of the risk transform, right? So then by spectral theory, I know that any power alpha between one and two, between zero and two, as, as operators, rise this way. So now, I can, so if I write it at the level of norms, it tells me that uh, I want to prove that m alpha f times f in Rn respect to the d mu2 is less than uh, c times the norm of L alpha of 4 of mu2 of f L2 mu2 of Rn. Okay, this is, I have just rewritten, right? You see what I do. I, have, I start from this inequality, I write it as an operator, a, uh, an inequality on operators. I raise it to the power alpha, I have the right to do it by spectral theory, and I in, reinterpret it in 2 So now my goal is that this term is a good one. This is a norm of F square in the ball of radius B. In, in, in the ball of uh, B. So I have to bound this term by the Gagliardo norm. And if I do that, I'm done. The thing that you could think, the thing that there, there is a tricky part here, but you think that you are not far from, I mean, you have to work, but you are not, you are in good shape. <clears throat> in the sense that this is not true that the Bessel space, I mean, this is not true. Let me explain you why this is not a trivial result. This is not true that the set of function in L2 such that delta S over 2 of F is in L2 of omega, okay, equal the space of F in L2 of omega such that the Gagliardo norm is finite. This, is not, this, this equality between spaces is not true for omega. There is an inclusion, but this equality is not true. Okay? So this space, this space is actually included into this one. So you can bound, so this is something that you can, so here my, my space is more complicated because I have a measure, a weighted measure. But my bound, this thing you can find in Tribble's book. Well, if you dig out, you manage to dig out triple, but basically this is written somewhere. So this is, so, so you cannot say that directly that any power is gonna be controlled by what I want in terms of Gagliardo norm. And if I'm on the manifold, I not, don't even know that it's been written somewhere in any case. That. So, 
the first lemma that you want to prove is a spectral lemma. You're going to relate, so it's a standard thing in, uh, so I have no time. So let me give you the first two lemma, the two crucial lemma to prove the self-improvement. The first crucial lemma is uh, uh, a spectral lemma. The spectral lemma tells you the following. It tells you that you can bound L alpha mu2 in L2 of Rn with mu2 by a constant times the sum from 0 to infinity of t minus 1 minus alpha over 2 times the resolvent, I mean a resolvent, Okay, why do you have that? You have that because you know very well, I mean, you have all these functional analytic formulas relating powers of uh, operators, of elliptic operators, <coughs> to the resolvent or to the heat kernel, right, by functional calculus. So the first thing that you prove is that you bound this term by this term. Now you need a bound on the resolvent and from the resolvent, and the, so the bound that you get on the resolvent is Gaffney type bounds, which are very easy to obtain. This is just an energy inequality. So the second lemma that you need. Yeah, I, I write it now. La lemma is the off diagonal Gaffney or Gaffney type estimates. So you take two sets, E and F, on your manifold which are disjoint. Okay? They are disjoint. Um, so what you can prove is that the resolvent in L2 of F plus T times plus the derivative L2 of F is bounded by Eight, what well, a universal constant, but in this case, this is eight, times the universal constant, square root of t, f l2 into e. So you see what I do here, more or less, right? Uh, no, you don't see? You take two, bound, two disjoint set of your manifold, and this inequality, this gap of diagonal inequality, tells you that you can control the resolvent in one of the set by the function, so you have a boundedness, but you see that in the other set. So this is off diagonal because you are not having the same set here and here. They are disjoint. And you pay the price of the distance divided by square root of t, you pay the prior exponential minus the distance. No, I mean, you, pay, you have this constant coming with the distance between the two, okay? Uh, this is not uniform in the distance, if you want. I, I, well, it can be, yeah, this is positive, but, uh, but uh, you, 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 you have like a precise bound on, on uh, so actually, this type of thing are easy to understand. If you call it that U, okay? Huh? Identity plus, I think it is, that in the formula, yeah.
No, 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 for T, this is for T positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, L is positive, so it comes with a minus here. Yeah. Yeah, 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 no, I agree, I agree, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, so how do you prove that? You take like, you, 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 you call it that U. So you want an estimate on U, you agree? So you have a PD for U, which is U plus T L mu 2 U equal to F, and F is given, okay? And now you multiply that, but you do an energy inequality, a Cacciopoli inequality, U times phi square, and phi is suitably chosen. And I don't remember what it is, but it has to be a cutoff suitably cho chosen, and then uh, you modify phi. I mean, this is just an energy. You have this inequality for free, actually. You, there is nothing hard behind. OK, so let me finish, because I'm running out of time. So basically, once you have these two lemma, you are reaching like what you want. Because you take your manifold, you take a covering of your manifold by pairwise disjoint cubes. And starting from there, you make a peer f minus its average, OK? And you estimate everything respect to that to that est Gaffney estimate, uh, because you are on pairwise disjoint cubes with distance two to the j or something like that. And, uh, and um, at some point, I mean, you do the computation. And at some point, you have to estimate quantities of the type omega of the ball. But because your omega is strong A infinity, This is comparable to distance to the power n. And so from, from there, uh, you, uh, you deduce your fractional point inequality. So I think I'm going to stop now. Thank you very much.